Uh, I'm very pleased to say that, that uh, Reverend Joe Boot has, has uh, arrived uh, unscathed from his uh, traffic accident. <laughs> But at least he's still ambulatory, which is a, a good sign. Uh, and I'll call on Jordan to do a more formal uh, introduction. Okay. Um, so, on behalf of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, I'm very excited to introduce Reverend Joe Boot uh, behind me. He is originally from England. Uh, but came to Canada with his wife to serve in the field of Christian apologetics, worldview education, and evangelism, particularly among students and culture shapers. He served with Ravi Zacharias for seven years as an apologist in the UK and Canada, working for five years as the Canadian director of RZIM. He has spoken in lectures and debates all over the world, and is currently the senior pastor of Westminster Chapel in Toronto, and founder of the Ezra Institute for Contemporary Christianity. Let's give him a hand. Before we begin, I just wanted to say a couple of words about, the, about how the debate is going to run. Uh, the technicalities, these lights in front of me are, are um, will, keep, uh, will keep the time. Uh, each speaker will have 20 minutes for their opening statements. Uh, and uh, at the, after uh, 18 minutes, it'll switch from, from uh, green to, to yellow. And then uh, when it turns red, that means you're dead. Uh, <laughs> this would be a good, uh, a good point just to tell you a little story about, uh, uh, I, I sing in a choir and, uh, and one uh, night our, we, our, we were instructed by our choir director in singing our song not to take a breath after death. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm happy to say that, that our speakers will be uh, allowed to take a, a, a breath after death. Uh, they, they will each have a, uh, a um, opportunity for rebuttal, and uh, and so that will come come afterwards. Uh, each will have uh, ten, ten minutes for rebuttal, followed by uh, five minutes for for cross examination. So, uh, without further ado, uh, Reverend uh, uh, Reverend Boot, please, uh, and and you have a couple of minutes to make an introductory uh, statement. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for your patience. I want to first of all thank the, uh, the two associations that uh, have invited me to participate in this uh, discussion tonight. And uh, also I want to apologize for the lengthy uh, delay uh, that you've had to uh, endure. I, I'm sorry about that. Uh, it's been an interesting 36 hours. Yesterday I started feeling very unwell. And, um, and then on my way here I had a car accident in which uh, the bonnet of my vehicle practically uh, came through the windshield and I had to get up to the collision center and uh, sort of all of that out and then uh, make my way here. So uh, I, apologize, uh, I apologize for the delay, but I am here. That's the main thing, I'm still alive. And I was beginning to wonder whether Dan was... Uh, <laughs> I was beginning to wonder whether Dan was poking pins into a doll somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, it turned out providentially because uh, after banging my head on the bonnet, I had two minutes of brain death where I can report to you that there is life after death. <laughs> <laughs> I have no such empirical evidence, but I, I will begin. Tonight's uh, discussion, tonight's debate topic isn't an isolated question. And like all ultimate questions, it is answered only in terms of one's worldview or your perspective, your ultimate perspective on reality. It's dependent, the answer to this question is dependent or contingent upon our worldview, a set of assumptions that we have about the world and through which we will interpret any evidence that is given to us. Uh, nobody comes to this question without a worldview bias, including myself. We all have a set of in interconnected beliefs about reality, and based on those beliefs, we will assess what we think is plausible, what we think is possible, the kind of evidence that we think is credible. So we will interpret any evidence given to us in light of our worldview. And so the question of life after death is dependent upon more basic 
questions that I think need to be addressed first. So tonight's discussion, tonight's debate, is actually a clash not over an isolated bit of evidence or a lack thereof of near-death experiences, uh, nor is it a question of what we would prefer to be the case autobiographically about life uh, after death. It's actually a debate about the nature and character of, of reality itself and the nature of human knowledge. It's a, a religious question inescapably. Now, I hope you will not be offended if I tell you that even if you're an atheist here tonight, you have a God concept. That is, you have an idea of the divine per se. That is, you believe in some sort of non-dependent reality. You believe in something in which everything else depends. Now, for me, everything depends upon the God of the Bible, God of Scripture. So that, uh, that the basis of my worldview is the triune God of the Bible. For Dan, I suspect, it is matter and energy upon which everything else depends. For others, uh, some people believe in some form of impersonal uh, being, some kind of impersonal force. But really, there are only two worldviews as you approach this question. There are two perspectives on reality, and to help you remember them, I'm just going to call them the oneist and the twoist worldview. The second view, the twoist worldview, is the one that I hold to. Reality is divided into two. There is created reality, and there is uncreated reality. There is the being of God, and then there is everything that he has created outside himself that depends upon him. Things visible and things invisible. Minds, bodies, uh, uh, seas, laws of thought, things visible, things invisible. The oneist view of reality, the other worldview by contrast, essentially says that all reality is one. Uh, there is no creator-creature distinction. We live in a universe of total flux, of total change. There's no God that transcends energy and matter in the universe. Actually, it's really a multiverse. You can't have a universe in a world without God. There is no unifying principle in the midst of diversity. There is just diversity. Now, I think Dan's version, from what I've never debated uh, Mr. Barker before. I hope you don't mind me calling you Dan, Mr. Barker. Uh, I, and I've never debated the topic of life after death before. But I think uh, Dan is presupposing a materialistic view of reality. Now, we cannot prove our God concept, our most basic belief, directly. Nor can we prove secondary beliefs, like life after death, directly. We can only look at them indirectly. For a start off, there, isn't, uh, there, is, there is a poverty of empirical evidence to start talking about life after death. I'm, as far as I'm aware, neither myself nor uh, Dan have gone beyond the grave and empirically, empirically observed what is after death, and that you haven't either. That makes it pretty difficult to start offering direct evidence. To prove anything requires that you accept an undoubted starting point. But since we don't have all the facts of the universe in, none of us, we have to take certain things on faith. We all believe certain things in order to make sense of reality. Uh, the only person who could actually know all things from the end to the beginning of the world would be the God who created and knows and governs all things. That individual would, of course, be God. So knowledge can only begin with knowledge. Uh, life after death, then, since uh, we've not been beyond the grave, uh, we don't come back with empirical support for it today. We haven't interviewed anybody who's gone beyond the grave, although there are occultists today who would say that they have, uh, mediums and so on, who believe that they are speaking on behalf of people from beyond the grave. I've never done any such thing. And there is an endless dispute, therefore, about the validity or invalidity of near-death experiences and disputes about what people see, what they haven't seen, and so forth, that to my mind are basically a waste of time. The question we really need to ask is, what view of life, which worldview, the atheistic one which denies the soul and life after death, or the theistic one, actually makes sense or intelligible our human experience? We need to justify our views, then, about life after death on the basis of the foundational beliefs that undergird them. Now, my acceptance of life, 
after the cessation of my physical vital functions is based on my belief in the existence of God. Uh, and I believe, I have a conviction that reality is more than matter in motion. <laughs> I have a conviction that, uh, that this is a moral universe. So I believe in God, first of all, that's my first reason for believing in life after death. My second reason is that I believe we're more than matter in motion. My third reason is I think this is a moral universe and that uh, for this to be a moral universe, objectively, there needs to be an ultimate judge of the universe requiring life after death. And finally, I believe Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And actually, I believe more than this. I believe that unless these things are true, our human experience is absurd and our debate tonight is meaningless. That is to say, I want to make the rather bold claim that uh, this debate to be meaningful presupposes the truth of my worldview. And that Dan tonight will actually be borrowing from my belief system to make sense of his own, to argue for the truth of his own. Uh, how am I going to do that? Well, let me begin. There is life after death because God exists. Now, theists believe, I think we'd agree, it's theists who tend to believe in life after death. Atheists don't. If Christian theism is true, even though uh, I grant that there has been a universal belief in some kind of life after death amongst pagans and so on, in Greek philosophy and Roman philosophy and Hindu thought and Buddhist thought and so on, it's only belief in the... Uh, uh, the Judeo-Christian concept of God that's also been uh, become part of the Islamic conception of God to a certain degree, that has a God stationed outside of the universe, independent from it, who holds all people accountable to God. And so really what we have is a choice between an impersonal view of reality and a personal explanation for reality. The one is going to give us God and life after death, the other isn't. The universe is either then personal, purposeful, or it is an emanation from the void. And we are a statistical anomaly in the chaos, as Bertrand Russell so poignantly put it. Now, I think that we can uh, recognize first God's existence by the fact that without him, our uh, human experience is rejoiced to an absurdity. There is, in a sense, an impossibility of the contrary view. If the universe isn't created by God, then there is no design plan in terms of a total meaning uh, from the first atom to the end of the world. There's no pre-established order. There's no pre-established relationship between the facts of our experience. We are just confronted with brute, meaningless factuality. I have three children, and when they were learning to draw, uh, they would uh, do uh, join the dot puzzles, connect the dot puzzles. And usually the dots would have a number next to them, and kids learn to draw by recognizing a shape as they connect the dots, a shape emerges. Now, the theistic view of reality is that there is, uh, there is an author to the puzzle, if you will, and that as we encounter the facts of our experience, the dots on the page, as we connect them, we discover God's meaning. There is a meaning there because it's been created by God. The atheistic worldview posits a sea of dots, but there is no pre-established relationship between those dots, between the facts of our experience. It is undesigned, unpremeditated, unplanned, a chaos of particulars. And when you come to the universe today, your problem you see tonight is not simply just to ask, well, is, do I have a soul and am I going to live on after death? Your first question is, is there any meaning, can I identify any meaning or truth in the universe at all? I have no doubt that uh, Dan tonight will have done his homework and he'll be talking about rationality, facts, reason, evidence, and so on and so forth. But what do those things presuppose about the world? They presuppose, as Paul Davies, the science, scientist and researcher, pointed out, he says science has, has its own faith and belief system. All science proceeds on the assumption that nature is ordered in a rational and intelligible way. You couldn't be a scientist if you thought the universe was a meaningless jumble of odds and ends haphazardly juxtaposed. They expect to encounter additional elegant mathematical order, but where do these laws come from and why do they have the form they do? Now, what kind of evidence is relevant to tonight's debate? Should I be coming to you with a, with a, with a series of testimonies about people who have suffered brain death and come back? Well, if I want to examine whether a piece of music is beautiful, I actually don't look at a CD under the microscope. 
If I'm asking what is the nature of numbers, I don't collect all the fridge magnets I can find to study their physical properties. If I want to know if Dan's arguments are rational tonight, I don't crack his head open to inspect the tissue of his brain. And if I want to know if there is a soul, I don't dissect the cerebral cortex. So my argument centers around whether a worldview without God and the concept of the soul is intelligible to us at all. As interesting as these discussions about hallucinations and brain death may be, they are secondary as to whether Dan tonight, representing the atheist worldview, has an intelligible set of concepts with which to even address the question. What has to be true about reality to allow our experience to be what it appears to be? Are we more than the sum of our parts? Is there a ghost in the machine? Are we more than our constituent physical parts? Now, I think that God is a necessary precondition to the intelligibility of my understanding myself as a human being. <clears throat> Some of you will be familiar with the Scottish empiricist, the religious skeptic, David Hume. He asked this question about what we can really know about ourselves, about God, about morality, about life and death, and so on. And he said, in the end, we only have perceptions. We have no idea about the reality behind them once God is out of the picture. There is no evidence, he said, for God. He said there's no evidence for a material world. He said we have real and certain knowledge, he thought, of the external world. All metaphysical beliefs about the world, he said, are impossible. He said the law of, the, uh, of uniformity of nature. He says are not, when we talk about laws of nature, he says these are not observations, laws of thought, laws of science, and so on. He says these are beliefs. But he says on what basis do we warrant these beliefs? How can we have valid ideas about future events that we haven't experienced if all of our knowledge is based on empirical experience? How do you know the sun's going to rise tomorrow? Have you been to tomorrow to see if the sun will rise? And if you say, well, it, ro it rose yesterday, you don't experience yesterday today, and that presupposes the reliability of your memory. Hume also pointed out events are not necessarily connected he said they are, they are separate. They may be conjoined, but there's no necessity of connection. And along came Immanuel Kant, who was panicked by this conclusion of David Hume, and says, well, okay, fair enough. We can't know what the real world actually is, but at least we can psychologize knowledge. We can say that uh, we know things as they appear to us. And we'll just have to build our, our ideas around this. Now, honest atheists have actually seen the implications of this and given us the mood of our time, which I would describe as existential. Sartre said, we are a bubble on an ocean of nothingness. We can't know anything. Now, we will say, well, hang on a minute, Joe. I know what I know. But the skeptics have often pointed out, if you begin with yourself, the finite self, you cannot get beyond yourself. You know you've got ideas, you've got impressions, the content of your brain, but how do you know anything more than that? The constant threat of solipsism is there, which simply means the mind alone. How do you know without God that, that there is a reality in an external world and there are even other people, other minds? The reality is we can't. There is no successful argument to show any of those things. Now, for Dan, with an impersonal universe and no God, there's no absolute context tonight either to judge whose arguments are valid. We've all got our own finite perspectives. We've all got our own minds, our own brains, our own thinking. But how do we know whose perspective is valid if there is not an ultimate context? There's a web of beliefs. But how do you judge the validity of one belief or the other about life after death without the God who gives life after death? In other words, the existentialist tradition is right in holding that what is given to us is a non-rational world, and then we have to try and rationalize that non-rational with the ideas that arise in our brain, which is a collection of atoms that shake down in a particular way, chemical reactions. My worldview holds, though, that the nature, that nature and history are governed by God who ordained and created them, and this is a universe of total meaning, where there is a real pre-established relationship be, uh, between all the facts of our experience, and that when we learn, when we know things, we are discovering objective meaning that's actually there because it's created and governed by the providence of God. 
If we eliminate the God of Scripture, we're left with an apparent and infinite number of brute facts that are unrelated, unknowable, totally irrational, they're impervious to reason. If you take a billion zeros, you say, well, I've got loads of information, I've got loads, and I'm going to put all these, zero, all these zeros together. If you get a billion zeros, you've still only got zero. And so what we have, essentially, in the atheistic mind is a schizophrenic nature. Atheistic materialism is schizophrenic because on the one hand, we want to insist that there be sound thinking and that uh, we must be rational, we must be reasonable, we must regard God as non-existent or an open question, that we can get along just fine in our thinking without God. But on the other hand, the atheist is always assuming a naive realism of order and structure and design and purpose and law and even morality because if I misrepresent Dan's views tonight, he's not going to be happy about it. So truth... These are all perpetually assumed and taken for granted. Now, there's life after death as well because we're more than matter. This is my second argument, very quickly. If we are the product of undirected naturalistic processes, don't we have a very good reason to doubt the deliverances of our own minds? What can naturalistic evolutionary account of origins give us with respect to believing that our belief-forming processes furnishing with anything, furnish us with anything like an accurate picture of the world? Our cognitive faculties, according to this view, have arisen from irrational animals. And if you have reason to doubt your belief-forming processes, then you have reason to doubt your beliefs, including a belief that there's no life after death. The naturalistic, materialistic position is inherently irrational and can only lead to skepticism. Charles Darwin himself said this in a letter to uh, uh, W. Graham on the 3rd of July, 1811. He said, with me, the horrid doubt always arises whether, con whether the conviction of man's mind, which has developed from the mind of lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust the convictions of a monkey's mind if there, were any, if there were any convictions in such a mind? We have not arrived at the validity, you see, of our, our rational cognition by a calculation. We've not observed the validity of our empirical obs We have not observed the validity of our rational uh, faculties. We just trust them. But is our software to be trusted? If it's not created by God, I don't see how. And then there is the problem that arises when we think about life after death with respect to the mind or the brain. And this is an epistemological problem. It's a problem of knowledge. Is there a distinction between our brains and our minds? Can physical properties account for thought? That is to say, can the semiotics of the words on this paper be explained by the ink and chemistry of the paper and ink? Can the meaning of the words on this page be reduced to the chemical composition of the ink and paper. Is thought material? Is meaning material? No, these are carriers. The paper and ink are carriers of information. They are carriers of uh, thought, but they are not the thought. And yet on the atheist account, this is what we're supposed to believe. Everything's uh, understood in terms of chemistry and physics alone. But if there's no God and no soul, we're just molecules in motion. There is no real mind. We are a random firing of chemicals and electro electrical event in our brain. In other words, our thoughts tonight are just brain gas. You're sat here tonight listening to this debate and there's just a chemical reaction going on in your brain. It's gas. And your, your gaseous explosion is uh, leading you to one conclusion and mine is leading me to another. In such a world, two thoughts, two positions about the life after death cannot confront each other in rational discourse. Unless there's a soul, there is no rationality. against the proposition of uh, life after death. 
Thank you, Gordon. Thank you, Shauna. Thank you, InterVarsity and Atheist Group, uh, Windsor, Essex, Essex County. Uh, thank you, Joe. And as a thank you, I, I told the audience earlier that I was going to give you a thank you gift. <laughs> <laughs> That's evidence that not praying leads to success. I didn't pray, and I did win. You, did, you won. I, you can roll it up. You've won a uh, what is it? A latte, whatever it is. So. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was from downstairs. Um, you missed the joke earlier, but we had a lot of fun. Not at your expense, by the way. Millions of good people in this country and on this planet do not believe in an afterlife. Good people, moral people, happy people, people with meaning in their life, people with joy, people with love in their lives, reject the idea of life after death and think that life is actually better without such a belief. That such a belief actually cheapens our lives. It actually detracts from the meaning of our lives. When I was a preacher, I used to preach a lot. I preached from every book of the Bible for 19 years. The most famous book, uh, famous verse in that book, is, of course, is for evangelicals, is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life, eternal life or everlasting life, as it says in the King James. I believed it. I, I, I thought the world was going to end at any time, like a thief in the night. Jesus was coming, and that he was going to take us to heaven or some other place you might end up going. I now know that all of that is not true. I used to believe it, I felt it, I, you know, I preached it. I now know that uh, there is no good reason to believe in a God, none. There are anecdotes, there are arguments that are given, but there's no evidence for a God. And did we hear any tonight? No, we heard about worldviews, but we didn't hear any evidence. If there were evidence for a God, think about it. By now, somebody should have won the Nobel Prize for pointing out this hitherto unknown force in the universe or cosmos. If there were real evidence, we would see it, we would have it, it would be on the table. What we have are misinterpretations through the lens of a world view, as Joe admits. He has a, a pre-existing assumption, which he admits is a bias, which allows him to read books like the Bible through these glasses of his worldview and say, aha, there's truth there. I used to feel the truth, but it's not evidence for a God. There's no coherent definition of a God. No one has ever given us any definition by which we can say what we're even talking about. Believers themselves disagree about the nature of this God and about its moral principles. Name any social issue of the day. You think we live in this moral universe? Name any social issue that we're struggling with. Gay marriage, abortion rights, birth control, doctor-assisted suicide, the war, uh, uh, stem cell research, you name it, you find good, devout, church-going, praying, Bible-believing Christians on both sides of those issues. There's no moral agreement about the nature of this God or his moral principles. In spite of the fact that Paul in the Bible wrote that God is not the author of confusion, I can think of very few books that have caused more confusion than the Bible. There is no moral cohesion to the Christian message or to any theistic message. I know there are no good arguments for a God. The cosmological, uh, Joe referred to some of the uh, formation of the initial constants or, or some of those ideas of, uh, of randomness and so on. All of these arguments for a God have been debated and debated and debated. Like Bertrand Russell said about the ontological argument, they just boil down to bad grammar is what they are, really. <laughs> if there were good arguments, we would see them, we would hear them. What we usually have are evidences from ignorance. We have God of the gap arguments. How do you explain this? How did the initial constants come to have the values they are if it was by random chance? Life wouldn't have existed without that. So therefore, since we don't have an answer, God just becomes a mystery that answers a, another mystery. We don't have evidence. We don't have a coherent definition. We don't have agreement among believers. We don't have uh, any good answers to these, the problem of evil, for example. There have been a number of theodicies proposed for the problem of evil. All you have to do to know that there's no God, or at least no good God, walk into any children's hospital. People who take the word of God for what it says, the prayer of faith will heal the sick, all things whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, believe in you shall receive. Good, church-going, praying Christians, praying, please God, please, and those kids die at the same rate as random chance. 
If there is a God, and we better hope there's not, he's a monster. He does not answer prayers. He does not keep his words. Uh, such a God empirically does not exist because of the failure of prayer, the failure of prophecy. And of course, uh, holy books like the Bible. The Bible that I used to preach from, uh, you know, if I even did have a worldview that was predisposed to believe in this, in this theistic concept, the Bible itself doesn't hold up. It's not a reliable book. It is internally contradictory. It goes against a lot of history. It contradicts a lot of science. It has a lot of immoral teachings within it. Uh, the Bible itself is not a good guide for truth or for morality. If we were to follow the teachings of the Bible, most of us would have to be locked up. If we were to follow Jesus' teaching, this world would be in a much worse place if you look at the actual teachings. The Bible is not a basis for truth. No holy book is the basis for any world view when you look at it. And I used to believe it, and I was shocked at what my rose-colored Christian glasses were allowing me to ignore about what's in that book. Any worldview that's based on the Bible is morally bankrupt and intellectually bankrupt as well. Joe is trying to frame this debate as if it were an either-or kind of thing. You have this worldview, or you have the only two options are this worldview. That's not how it's framed at all. Christians like to frame it like that because, you know, I used to believe I had the truth and everything else out there was the opposite worldview. It's not that at all. The burden of proof in any argument is on the shoulders of the person making the claim. Joe and I both agree. There's a natural universe. There's no doubt about that. There's a natural universe, there's atoms, there's forces and all that. But Joe thinks there's a supernatural realm above and beyond what we both agree, populated by these immaterial personalities like souls and spirit. He, is, he thinks there is an immaterial reality to things. Uh, he is asserting something extra above and beyond what we both agree with. Joe and I both agree that we are biological organisms. He agrees with that. We do have neurons. We do have chemicals. There's nothing really special about our bodies that we don't find out in nature anywhere else. The chemical reactions, the processing, the functioning of the mind. But Joe believes, in addition to what we both agree with, he believes there's something else. He believes that there are, is a thing called a spirit or a soul that uh, transcends the bio. We, we are biological animals is what we are. We function much like our other animal relatives on this planet. Our brains are bigger, we're special in many ways, but other species are special in their own ways. And uh, I'm glad I'm a human being and not a sea slug at the bottom of the ocean. Although in the sea slug, you have the same chemical processes. When a sea slug dies, does, does its spirit live on somewhere? I mean, is there life after death or other organisms? Why, why are humans special? Because we have this illusion in our mind of consciousness. Joe has the burden of proof that there is life after death, and he should at least attempt to give us some evidence. He mentioned the resurrection, and I wish he'd gone into greater detail about the resurrection, because the resurrection is not good evidence. The resurrection of Jesus in the Bible is probably the worst example anyone could possibly offer for the truth of the Bible. And that's not an exaggeration. It's because most Bible stories are given once or twice, the resurrection is given at least five times, and you can compare them, you can see how contradictory they are. They are discrepant, they don't agree. Even conservative scholars agree that it's bad history. There are many other reasons why the resurrection of Jesus Christ is probably the weakest argument anyone could offer uh, for life after death. As Christopher Hitchens used to say, that which can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. If we don't have evidence for it, then we non-believers can just say whatever our worldview is, you haven't made your case. You have the burden of proof. Uh, there's reasonable doubt. Therefore, I'm, I'm not going to believe what you are asking me to believe. I'm not going to put on your worldview glasses. What is it exactly that survives death? What is Joe talking about when he's talking about life after death? What are we discussing here? A soul, an immaterial consciousness, in order for anything to exist, anything at all, we have to distinguish it from not existing. We have to be able to measure it in some way. In order for something to exist, we have to say how big it is, or how much it weighs, or how much space it occupies, or how long it is in. We have to have some way of identifying it. Otherwise, we're just using a word. The word spirit just becomes blah. What does spirit mean? What does soul mean? 
Science has shown us that there's an exquisite dependence on the brain of consciousness. We have no evidence at all that consciousness can exist apart from a functioning brain. The mistake that Joe's making, and the mistake that a lot of theists and Christians and other theists make, is they think that consciousness is a thing. Joe is imagining that consciousness is this item, this immaterial object, or, or some might say the same thing about the word mind or about the word spirit. There's this thing in the universe. But consciousness is not a thing. It is not an identity. Consciousness is a function. Mind is a function of an organ that's functioning. If I have a soul, then where is it? How big is it? How do you identify it? I'm going to walk across the stage and I'm going to come back here and I want you to watch me when I do this, all right? Watch, watch my... Uh, presuming that there's a brain inside of the skull. Watch this. <laughs> Okay, you saw my head walk across and come back. What happened to my soul during that time? What happened to it? Did it follow along? Did that soul that supposedly survived death, is it trapped inside of my skull? Did it kind of closely follow or not? How would I know, you know, what, what is it, this thing that's supposedly surviving the death of this animal body of ours? What is it? How do you know what that thing is? Most scientists agree that consciousness, mind, ideas, dreams, thoughts are functions of a functioning brain. Just like when you unplug the computer, that software, that functioning of that machine that almost looks like you're interacting with something alive, where does it go? Where does the soul of the computer go when you unplug it? It doesn't go anywhere. There is no soul. There is no thing there. It's the functioning that makes it happen. These neurons that evolved over millions of years are functioning in a certain way. When I walked across that stage, it wasn't just my brain, another organ was going across, my stomach. My stomach walked across and it came back again. What happened to digestion? Did you notice what happened? What, did digestion follow with my stomach or didn't it? Digestion is not a thing. Digestion is a label, a description for the functioning of a bodily organ. There's no such thing as a capital D digestion in the cosmos, of which when our bodies die, that digestion is going to survive the stomach, right? <laughs> Consciousness, mind, thoughts are functions. They are not things. We don't ask. It's a silly question to ask, what happens to digestion when the body dies? What a dumb question, right? What happens to consciousness when the brain dies? What a dumb question. The brain stops functioning. The consciousness doesn't exist anymore. The plug is pulled. Of course, we have this illusion in our minds that somehow this consciousness of ours is some kind of a thing, uh, but we know how unreliable that is. You wake up in the middle of the night screaming because you had a nightmare. You had a very real experience. Your palms are sweating. Your heart's pounding. You woke up the house. Something very real happened. There's no doubt about it. You had a very powerful experience, but there's no boogeyman crawling in the window. It's in your mind. It's all happening in the mind as a function of what the mind's doing. We all know that dreams don't represent reality. They might reflect it a little bit. We all know that near-death experiences don't reflect a reality either. Don't re represent reality either. They might represent certain cultural aspects. And we see with near-death experiences that there's a cultural component to it. In India, they see Yamraj, the, the bookkeeper. In Thailand, they see uh, Yamatuts. And in, in the Western world, they tend to see Jesus. Uh, so our brains, being conditioned by our culture and by, by the society we live in, tend to build kind of a reflection of the reality we're in. It doesn't mean that there's such a thing as a soul. During my rebuttal time, I'm going to address some of the specific remarks that Joe made. But since we know that there is no evidence for a God, no good argument for a God, there's no coherent definition of a God. There's no agreement among believers about a God. We know these things. Uh, and since we know that there's no need for a God, because you can have a life of value and meaning and joy and purpose and all of that in a meaningless universe. There is no meaning of life. There is no meaningful universe. And it's good that there's not. If there were a purpose and meaning of life, that would mean you and I are... What? Slaves, servants, secondary, soldiers, we're part of something above us. 
Uh, it, it would cheapen our lives to think that somehow there's this overriding meaning up there that I have to fit into, like, you know, a good humble servant or a good child doing what the daddy wants me to do. The fact that the universe itself is completely meaningless, that is meaningless, because meaning can only come from within a functioning brain, a functioning mind. The fact that there's no meaning of life is wonderful. That doesn't mean there's no meaning in life. Meaning in life comes from solving problems. Fighting hunger, fighting predation, fighting disease, fighting war, fight whatever there's a problem to solve in your life, then that's where meaning comes from. Meaning is not something up there that we think, oh, the universe has to have meaning. As if you even ask the question, does the universe have meaning, you are smuggling your conclusion into your premise. You are begging the question. You are assuming in the question that, the universe must have some kind of a mind of its own. And the fact that we don't exist within a context of meaningfulness is turning things upside down. If there's a God, what context does He reside within? How does He decide what is right and wrong? How does He know? Is He just hanging out? How, what meaning is there in His life? If it's, if it's okay for there to be that brute fact that has no context of its own, no meaning above its own. If it's okay for you to put on that worldview and say you can refer to that brute fact, well, why not just refer to the brute fact of stopping with what we do know, that the universe itself, mindless and meaningless, can contain meaning within it because of the functioning brains of ours. When you die, that's it. Your digestion will cease to exist. When you die, that's it. Your consciousness will cease to exist. But we live now. If life is eternal, then life is cheap. We give more value, we give more meaning to things that are brief and precious. If the fact that life is going to end, the fact that it's going to be over, that there is no life after death, actually imbues greater meaning in our lives. Not to our lives, we don't need meaning to our lives, but in our lives. It gives us greater meaning because we realize how precious this life is, not to be sacrificed on the altar of bowing down to some dictator who declares that you need to set aside one day of the week to worship, otherwise all the fields are going to be scorched if you don't bow down and kiss his toes and worship his father's vanity. That's not where morality comes from. The fact that there is no evidence for a life after death actually makes, makes us have more meaning within our own personal lives. Now, I know Dr. Zeus did not say this. People attribute it to Dr. Zeus, and I'm not quite sure who said it, but it's a great quote. Uh, it's along the lines of what uh, Bertrand Russell said, that happiness isn't any less happy because it doesn't last forever. Um, the quote that probably Dr. Zeus didn't say is that don't be sad because it's over. Be glad that it happened. We get to live. We get to have our lives now. And that's what's important. That's what precious. That's what we all know. We don't know if there's a God. We don't know if there's an afterlife. We haven't heard any evidence for either of them. We've only been instructed to pick a certain pair of glasses to put on. But I, I insist that that is the wrong way to look at this debate. It's not an either or. It's him failing to meet the burden of proof and provide evidence and solid argument to for the, um, the deity and the afterlife that he is arguing. And I think I'm going to cut it short here in the interest of time. We've decided to cut our whole debate short. So I'll come back to rebuttal later. enter the second part of the program, the uh, rebuttal period, so I'll call upon each speaker to speak for 10 minutes uh, in, in rebuttal. First, um, uh, Reverend Joe Boot. Well, <clears throat> I've never uh, uh, had the uh, pleasure of meeting Dan before. I have heard something of his story. Uh, on the various YouTube interviews that have been done with him. Uh, I don't know what happened to him in his uh, previous uh, Christian life, uh, but he does try and make a great deal of hay out of his uh, so-called Christian past, and his touring around the US in his camper van singing about the apocalypse. And uh, the, well, this is his own words, he went around the, the US uh, singing about the apocalypse, and. Uh, I have sympathy with the fact that uh, some of the doctrines he says he was taught uh, did not help him. 
But what we've heard tonight, I'm afraid, is cereal box atheism. It's tabloid atheism of the kind that uh, we're very accustomed to hearing now in the, in the media and seeing in our newspapers and seeing in books that you pick up at the airport. Lots of people don't believe in life after death and are happy. Fine, that's just all autobiography. I didn't, I didn't say that people who don't believe in life after death or don't believe in God don't enjoy some degree of happiness. Uh, what uh, Dan has declared tonight, though, and he's just actually completely proved my point by the very straightforward, clear declarations that he's made, is that this debate tonight is pointless. There is no point in me coming. And there is no point in you coming, because you are flotsam. You are purely a physical, chemical, biochemical reaction. There are as many meanings in the universe, according to Dan, therefore, as there are brains. He's tried to argue that I'm asking sort of irrelevant questions, there's these two beliefs. No, no, no. I'm asking the foundational, epistemological, philosophical, tough groundwork that we have to take responsibility to ask rather than reading the, the back of Richard Dawkins' book. And the groundwork is to ask, how do we approach reality and interpret so-called evidence? I've just shown from atheists, from humanists, like, uh, and religious skeptics like David Hume, that they themselves were skeptical not only about God, but about all metaphysical claims about reality, even the physical world. Dan gets up and says, well, we, there's one thing we absolutely know, and that's there's no evidence for God. Well, Hume is asking an even more fundamental question. How can you have evidence for anything in a universe without God? Dan seems to be skipping over, skipping over in this crass scientism that is so wearisome to the flesh. 300 years of Western philosophy. I mean, are Sartre and Camus and Dan, are these people idiots? They're all atheists. If the universe is meaningless and there's no morality, well, why can't I just lie throughout the rest of this debate and misrepresent everything Dan's got to say? If you're just a brain, or just a biochemical reaction, you're all having a biochemical reaction now. So what is the basis for the validity of one biochemical reaction over the other? So let's, let me put it to you this simply. I'm a, I'm a biochemical reaction right now. He's, he's reduced the brain, the mind, to he's compared it to di digestion. Interestingly enough, uh, Dan does have a divinity concept. I talked about that. And uh, uh, if we are, if the universe is just matter in motion, just energy, just matter in motion, then all of us here, we're just matter in motion. We're just the swarm of atoms. Right now, there is a statistical possibility that you are digesting a small atom from Pierre Trudeau in your stomach, right? You're drinking, you've eaten, he's been reconstituted into the, uh, into the ground, taken up by the water cycle. I'd love to pass Pierre Trudeau through my digestive system. If I could. Uh, and maybe he is right now. Uh, but life, there is, if you're just atoms, of course you have life after death. On, his, on Dan's concept, you have life after death. Because your atoms are just reconstituted, uh, they may take a slightly different form. And since Dan has not been reconstituted at this point, okay, he's not dead, uh, then uh, he, uh, this, in this present form, then he does not know there isn't consciousness beyond this present form. I mean, this talking of certitude about these things is a plain absurdity. How can we have a logical, rational argument if all we're talking about is, I was going to say this in the, in the um, uh, cross-examination, but we might as well just get a couple of cans of pop, Dan shakes one, I'll shake the other, whichever fizzes most wins the debate, because that's all your brain is. That's all your mind is. This is the tough philosophical work that we have to do when we ask about uh, the fundamental question of God and life after death. Dan's just sidestepping the challenge. How does Dan's worldview, his belief system, not collapse into total absurdity? What he said tonight doesn't amount to a hill of beans. He's trotted out 50 things about the Bible. I, call, I can't answer those in 10 minutes. I need a week of lectures to deal with those things. You can read my books. There's a few of them for sale, all right? You can pick up books on Christian apologetics. I, the, the, what he said is just a bunch of assertions. He's, he's articulated... A worldview, though, he said, everything is material, there's no meaning, there's no objective morality, your brain is just gas and air, and uh, anything else is stupid. Anything else is just stupid, so everybody believes anything. And yet, what is the basis 
If there's no truth that transcends your mind and mine, on what basis do you judge who is right tonight? Whose chemical accident is correct? There isn't one. And therefore there isn't a... So the Christian theistic assumptions are required to make sense of this debate. And that's the point that I'm making. You cannot have an intelligible... He said the universe is irrational. There's no meaning. That's what I was asserting. We agree there. We've, we absolutely agree on that. Without God, there's absolutely no meaning. So you are confronted with a horde of irrationals, as the existentialist pointed out, and your brain gas has to interpret them for the first time. And all of you have the right, the absolute right, to give your own interpretation of reality. That's why truth has collapsed in our age. You see, Dan uh, wants to believe and kid himself into believing that most people today aren't interested in the supernatural or, or, or uh, uh, don't believe in, in spirits or uh, souls or whatever. And yet our culture is absolutely obsessed today with occultism. I bet many of you have been involved in playing with Ouija boards, table raising, levitation. Uh, our, our entertainment industry is saturated with the occult. Do you know why? Because we don't believe this bull anymore. That we are just made up of material bits and pieces. And if we are, then we're all God. That's the God concept of atheism. We're all scattered throughout the universe. And we always will be. So there is life after death. Either way, I win the debate. <laughs> What is your evidence for other minds, Dan, for example? You say that there is no evidence for immaterial things. How, if you have a big idea tonight, does your brain get heavier? Does everything, everything has weight extension in space? This is nonsense. Laws of thought, if there are laws of thought, and if there's going to be a debate, there have to be. They don't weigh anything. They don't have any extension in space. If you say, I've got a great idea, and you start really thinking on it, does your head start getting heavy? Oh, it's a big idea. <laughs> Everything isn't material. Just because, as well, it's possible for... Uh, Dan has said that, you know, people have accidents and, and uh, you know, that the brain, when the brain's affected, that's the end of consciousness. And nobody's denying, the Christian worldview does not deny... Two minutes does not deny that the, the human person is a unity, okay? That there is, uh, that I'm a corporeal, physical being, and that there is an, also an immaterial, incorporeal aspect to my being. Most of us basically intuit this reality. We don't really need a debate on the subject. We intuit the fact that there is an incorporeal, immaterial aspect to our being. Now, if I've got a computer, it's got hardware and software. If the hardware breaks, the computer doesn't function properly. Totally granted. Somebody has a car accident. Somebody has a, a, a disease uh, that affects them. Their, their thinking, their mind is going to be affected because we are a unity. But you don't infer from that, from the, if your hardware is broken, you don't infer the software doesn't exist. You just recognize it's not that, that, that as a unity, it's not functioning properly. He says there is no meaningful universe. There's no plan. There's no design. Well, that's just proving my point. He absolutely asserted exactly what I was saying. And on that basis, there can be no rational discussion or rational debate of any evidences for anything. And therefore, Dan, to get up and challenge me in this debate on this subject, he's borrowing from my worldview. He's borrowing meaning and rationality and logic and laws of thought and language and semiotics and everything else that cannot be justified in an atheistic worldview in order to refute me. His view is self-refuting, therefore his view of, why, uh, view of life after death doesn't amount, as I say, to a hill of beans. say there is no meaning in the universe. Wasn't I very clear to say that there is meaning in the universe? What I said was there's no meaning of the universe. There's no purpose of life. There's no meaning of life. But as long as there are problems to solve and a biological organism is designed, if I can borrow that word in a non-intelligent way, is designed by natural selection to survive because of the problems that it is solving for survival. There is 
rich meaning in the universe. All of our lives have rich meaning. If you're fighting a disease, if you're fighting hunger, and I, I went out of my way to say that, Joe is mischaracterizing what I said. And exactly what is it, Joe, that you're asking me to refute? You said I couldn't refute your arguments, but exactly what is it that's on the table here that you're asking me to refute? Define a spirit. Define a soul. When you do unplug the computer, of course the computer stops functioning. There's code written on a piece of paper that you could plug into another computer and run that code if it's the right chip that can run it. Um, and I used to be a computer programmer, so I know a little bit about all of that. But, and you can pass it from one computer to the other, just like with reading and with ideas, we can share ideas with each other. But DNA is code. The DNA, the genetics that we have inherited from our struggling, surviving ancestors that have passed down to us, because of natural selection, in a non-intelligent but still designed way by natural selection, we have ended up with some code. And when that computer is unplugged, there's no functioning there. And when your body is unplugged, there's no functioning there. You could look at somebody's cell and say, oh, look at this person. In fact, we can tell now from, from genetics what diseases you might be likely to get or maybe even what proclivities you might want to get. But I think most of you can see one of the category mistakes that Joe is making. Uh, he's saying the atoms on a piece of paper don't tell us anything about the meaning of the words. Of course not. Uh, the laws of physics, uh, you know, from quantum mechanics or from string theory or whatever you want to call it, uh, are another level up, another logical level up. The laws of physics are working in a certain way, but that doesn't tell us about how chemistry is going to work in the side of a cell. When you're looking at how a cell functions, you don't look down at the, the individual atoms. You're looking at a functioning organism, and it's that functioning that gives us the meaning of it. And from the cell, then we build up our own bodies, and there's even brain cells. So what a silly thing to say that we can't understand consciousness by looking at the physics of brain cells. Of course we can. That's, that's a non-question. Why are you even raising that as a question? Um, Bertrand Russell, in his debate with Father Copplestone, was pointing out the mistake of a lot of theistic assumptions to treat everything as if it were flat. We do know that there are levels upon... When you look at the weather, when you look at how clouds move, you don't look at quantum mechanics. I suppose you could reduce it all in some way, but it's meaningless to reduce it. We reduce it to the point where it makes some kind of a sense to us. So, um, this is not a debate between worldviews, as Joe is trying to, trying to point out. And what if this were cereal box atheism? Why is that an insult? I mean, what's wrong with cereal? I mean, what's wrong with a box that has something in it? I mean, why attack somebody with these, you know, rhetorical insults? Uh, you know, if atheism is nothing new, well, then Christianity is not new either. When my ancestors, the Native American tribe that my dad comes from, uh, were on this continent probably 15,000 years ago, which was... 9,000 years before the world was created, when you think about it. I mean, that was... Did, none of them believed in the Christian God. None of them had the revelation of the resurrection of Jesus. Did they not have meaning in their lives? Did they not have love? Did they not... Some of them might have thought there was an afterlife. Some don't. There are some tribes that have no concept of an afterlife at all and think that life is dead. So the, the Christian revelation doesn't, didn't really answer anybody's meaning in life. It's a new thing. Christianity is... You know, we've heard it for over and over. So to, uh, to attack another person's worldview because you've heard it before, well, the, the knife cuts in both directions. Joe admits, in his own word, there's a paucity of empirical evidence. And by the way, I did not use the word apocalypse. Those were not my exact words, as you said. I did believe in the end of the world. I didn't know what I thought about the apocalypse. But I did believe that Jesus was coming soon, and I preached that. And the Bible says that. Even Jesus preached that. He said, there'll be some of you who won't taste death until you see the end. Paul even believed that. Uh, and, you know, every generation of Christians has had a subset which thought we were living in the end times. Like, we're in a special time right now. They've all, the Millerites in the 1830s and the Jehovah's Witnesses in 1914 and, and some modern Christians today. So, Joe admits there's a paucity of empirical evidence. We are survival machines. We have brains that function more or less good enough. They're not perfect. And there's, you know, I, if I were designing a brain, I would probably think of a better way to do it, but we were designed with the laws of nature. 
to have perceptions about the natural world that we live in. As natural organisms, we bump into other things and there's harm and there's damage that can come from it. So because of that, we have DNA, we have a structure built into us from the accidental process of natural selection that allows us to make mental models of reality. It, 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 may, it may be philosophically that our mental images are not right and maybe our memories just can't be trusted. But it's all we've got, and it's all Joe has. And when Joe reads the Bible, I mean, when Joe gets these feelings about Jesus in the Bible, that's all he's got. That's all I've got. Maybe it is totally absurd. So what? What's wrong with absurdity? Maybe there is no meaning to it all. So what? Would you rather have the facts, or would you rather have wishful thinking? We do know, though, that within this level, logical level, within this functioning brains that we do have, we have a kind of basic optimal functioning where we can make informed decisions about what seems to be that real world out there. If it's not out there, then we're all victims of a, you know, an, an accidental joke, I suppose. But in the meantime, we all live our lives as if the perceptions that we receive from nature, which created us, nature is not our God, but nature is our creator, uh, that they more or less represent most of the time, and sometimes we're wrong, sometimes our instincts are wrong, most of the time give us a, an empirical basis for making judgments about the natural world that we live in. The way our brains function isn't great, isn't perfect, and, and you know, I don't, depends where you fall on the bell curve of brain functioning or emotion or that, but, but we're making it, we're getting through it, and someday we're all going to be extinct and it's not going to matter, there won't be any meaning or any memory to us, but we live now, and isn't that precious? I mean, isn't that, isn't that worth something? Life doesn't need a meaning. Life doesn't need a purpose. Life is its own reward. Are we more than the sum of our parts? No, we're not, but what's wrong with that? Isn't it, isn't, aren't, aren't you happy with what you have? If you're not, you're going to look for something like a Thor on Thursday. You're going to look for something like a Jesus. You're gonna, if you're not happy, if you feel empty in some way, then plug that gap with your God of choice, when, depending on the culture you live within. So, no, we are not more than matter, but we are matter that is functioning. This matter that we have, this brain cells that we have, this consciousness is a label not for a thing at all. And until Joe gives us some kind of a, who would, you know, if I'm thinking about a mouse and thinking about an elephant, of course my brain's not going to get heavier. Two I mean, minutes. isn't Joe proving my point? Joe's proving my point that there is no reality, there's no actual physical reality to these labels that are within our brains. There is no soul, there is no thing there. When that functioning stops, and you all know how your brain waves and brain states can alter and how things, you know, the Phineas Gage story, when his frontal lobe was blown out, how his whole personality changed. And um, there is no central you there. You, the you that you think you are is changing and shifting because of biological factors, because of chemical, because of drugs, because of diet, because of environment, because of pollution, because of social things, there's all this flux. You think you are a single person that has a thing that's going to live on. It's your body that matters. We are matter. We are material. We do know, and I wasn't saying that there's only matter in the universe, although that seems to be uh, the most logical conclusion. What I'm saying is that Joe and I both agree there's matter. Joe's a materialist because he believes there's matter as well as I do. He's making an additional assertion. An assertion which he has not supported with any evidence. All he has told you to do is put on some kind of a glasses of assumption, a bias that he says, a con inner conviction that the God of a particular Middle Eastern Bronze Age tribe happens to be the one true revealed God of history. You're free to do that in this country. But millions of us realize that um, that's just wishful thinking. That's sort of a, it's sort of a, denial of human nature. It's a kind of dismissal of who we really are. It's like, no, we are It's a pretense that we are more than the sum of our parts. I'm happy sticking with what we do know. And if there is life after death, I think that was what our debate was about. I would like to see some, some evidence, some, something that would, that would lead us, a skeptics, to at least consider that possibility. But it's not there. And yeah, conclude now, please. Thank you. The third part of our program will be one of cross-examination, so I'll ask both speakers to go to, the, to your microphones.
and uh, begin, uh, we'll, we'll begin uh, with uh, Reverend uh, Boot. Uh, you can address your first question to uh, Dan Bart. I'm glad you survived that near-death experience, Joe. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, Dan, you said that um, meaning is uh, not, uh, there's no meaning of, there's, there's meaning in. So uh, the meaning then is that something that, that we give. So, so meaning is purely personal. Is there, if meaning is purely personal and there are 350 people in this room, uh, how do we judge whose meaning is valid? Which is true? What's the basis for validating your meaning over mine? There's no meaning of life. And if there's a God, there's no meaning of his life either. Because he doesn't exist within a context. Meaning comes from solving problems, right? So you might, you might have a sibling who died of a horrible disease. So you devote your life to fighting that disease. You're solving a problem. That's meaningful to you. Okay. I don't have a sibling that died of that horrible disease. Can I come to that, to that point but then? Just, I'm trying to answer your Solving question. Problems? I'm trying to ask, answer your question. The fact that there are multiple meanings in life doesn't cheapen meaning. In fact, it, it enhances meaning. The okay. fact that we can all find the meaning through our attempts to solve whatever problem it is you're trying to solve. That's what meaning means. Okay. So, um, obviously, there are, people perceive different things to be problematic. So some people see uh, a lack of wealth distribution as a problem in the United States, others don't. Uh, to use an extreme example, Hitler thought he was solving a problem by, by getting rid of all the Jews and the gypsies and creating a, a, a super race. Stalin thought he was solving a problem for the Soviet Union by uh, eliminating about 40 million people. So how, how I ask the question, how are we to judge Who's me? Is it is it, is it the, the the dominant meaning? Is the person with the most power? How are we to judge which meaning or which pro what is a problem? People uh, diagnose the problems of the social order completely differently. You are confusing meaning with morality. They are two separate things. Meaning is solving problems. Hitler had a meaningful life. Stalin had a meaningful life. Those who resisted Hitler had a meaningful life. Those who resisted Stalin had meaningful lives. They were trying to solve problems. And Hitler, by the way, often credited Jesus as his inspiration for exterminating the Jews. He was a weird Christian. I don't think he was a Christian, but he was not an atheist, obviously. Stalin probably was an atheist. We don't have any comments from Stalin. We don't have any, any statements that Stalin said he was doing this in the name so of Hitler. So morality and meaning are unrelated, you'll say. I didn't say they're unrelated, I said they're two separate concepts. So you're, you're asking me a question about meaning, you said and you bring you morality said, into it. Said, As if there were, you know, you're talking, you're, you're talking about the fact that there are different meanings within our life as if that were a problem because there's not one moral standard for all the meanings? No, I'm saying that we, we have, uh, we define meaning differently depending on the worldview we're coming from, and that has radical consequences for how we judge what is the right meaning to adopt. I mean, how can you separate morality and meaning? That's, that's totally absurd. There's no how? right meaning to adopt. What right, you, okay. Why good. are you even saying that? that I mean, enough. meaning, there's no right meaning that to adopt. You're, you're, you're in the statistic mindset, right? That's helpful. There's no right meaning to adopt. Exactly. That's because your meaning okay. isn't what you're pretending. Morality is a different question. If you want to ask me a question about moral standards and, and how non-believers find moral principles, it, you know, and objectively ask, grounded, you can do that. But I'll, when we're talking about meaning itself, um, it sounds silly, but it's meaningless to talk about there being one meaning. If you think there's just one meaning, then you need a God. Yes, you do. So you've you have, to have in, an ultimate meaning. Yeah. Well, if you think you need an ultimate meaning, then you need a God. That's a problem that you have because... Of your inability. It's the only way to judge which meanings are valid. You don't judge which are meanings. Not. You don't judge whether a meaning Precisely. is valid. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you. You, judge you don't it. judge whether meanings Moral are valid. Moral questions can be judged, but the question of meaning. How do you? Okay, let's move on from that one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this, is, uh, second, uh, this is 
say, and then we'll give Dan a chance to. <laughs> okay. Ask a there's only five minutes of cross examination, so if he if he elaborates for too long, there's I only get one question. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, are there, uh, Dan, are there uh, universal laws of thought or logic which should govern the, uh, this debate? And are those laws material or are they immaterial? And if they are uh, based on how you um, approach that question, uh, how does your worldview, if you believe there are laws that would, should govern this debate, uh, how does your materialist worldview give us invariant laws of thought? There's a difference between a prescriptive law and a descriptive law. And I think you might be bordering on equivocation by talking about laws of thought as if they were prescriptive laws. We know that the speed limit, for example, is a prescriptive law. Don't drive this fast or there will be some consequence, right? But the laws of nature are not prescriptive. Anybody in Philosophy 101 knows this, that the laws of nature are descriptive. They're not telling you what you must do. So the laws of thought are not laws like a, a so social law. So Yeah, the, law, the laws of thought, if we can use that word law in a descriptive way, um, are labels to define how a functioning brain is coming to some type of, to make a decision, to some kind of a conclusion. So laws of thought do not transcend the brain. The, well, they don't, they don't transcend a functioning brain. I mean, you can write it down on paper, but it's there, still there a brain no, has to read it. Right? There, there are no prescriptive laws of rationality that would be transcultural, uh, that are invariant, that transcend the chemical event of my brain. Well, the concept of logic, of course. Logic is not a thing. Logic is what happens when you are putting together perceptions and thoughts and you're comparing A to A, is A not A, or is, a, or is there an excluded middle? Things like that, which are not laws. It's not like something that we have to look out in the universe for. But Dan, based on what you said, those are epiphenomena. They are byproducts of they're material. They're not epiphenomena. They're, they're not even things. They're not anything. Yet. They're not things. They're functions. They're simply functions. So it's yeah. a, a physical. A law of thought is just a physical function. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the ways. It's just like I wasn't comparing digestion to the to consciousness. By the way, I was just saying that one organ has a function, another one does. Obviously, the brain is much more complex. But we wouldn't say that digestion is a thing, would we? It's the way the organ is functioning. We wouldn't call it some entity. Is there a law of universal digestion? Yeah, I mean that's, I mean that's equivocating. That's comparing no, apples and oranges. It's not, it's not. It's not equivocating to talk about laws of thought. This is what philosophers have discussed for centuries. Yeah, but not are as there are there laws of rationality, entities, if you will. I mean the. Uh, the, many of the Pythagoreans, some of the mathematicians, believed in an eternal place where numbers uh, existed. Exactly. To say they're not prescriptive is to say that there's no way that I'm required to think. If they're just descriptive, well, I could describe another culture may have a different approach to logic, a different approach to rationality. A different time or age may have a different approach. So they're not then invariant. And there's no basis then for rationality that transcends the, the mind. How, how are these people here tonight, I'm asking, if, if thoughts are not causes of other thoughts, that is, an a thought being immaterial is not a co-cause or a cause of another thought, what is the basis upon which tonight, here, we are supposed to evaluate the rational validity of these two arguments? If it's just brain and brain function, and our brains are all functioning differently, uh, how are we supposed to judge Who's right between you and I? How, how, is, the, how is the audience supposed to judge the two? Who said that? Do you have a question you want to address uh, to... Uh, well, I do have one question, I guess, but it, can I answer this and then I'll ask him the one question? Are we, are we out of time? Well, we're running short, so if you can give a quick answer and then... Oh, I thought we were still in my cross-exam now. I haven't well, really given Dan much chance yet. We've got 10 minutes. So. Okay, well, I was enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the fact that... A is not non-A, is not a thing, right? It's an assumption that our brains make based on our experience. Maybe the, you can that imagine... your brain makes. Maybe you can imagine a universe in which A is not A. Maybe you can. But the universe that we live in, and by our, we evolved in a universe, a natural universe, that has functions in certain ways, and we describe those things as descriptive laws, not prescriptive. That's why I think you're equivocating. You're equivocating prescriptive with descriptive. We're describing how things actually are. When you describe the fact that A is not not A, 
You're not creating anything. That new. was the basis upon which Hume denied we could have any metaphysical truth. He said we can only describe. We cannot prescribe. So he said, out with metaphysics. Okay. Right? Fine. But you're, let's, let's just... but you're making metaphysical claims about what can and can't be I'm not making a metaphysical claim. Of course I'm you just are. observing what actually happens in real life. Well, That's you've, what you've science observed, is. You've observed the properties of matter? Science observes. Science doesn't prescribe. There are multiple theories, atomic theory and subatomic yeah, theory. Yeah, exactly. So how do you know what the properties of matter are? Or what their emergent properties are? The answers are. to science will come through observation. That's what the Higgs boson came from. It didn't come from somebody just writing out models. They come from observation of empirical... No, mathematical models are applied to test whether an observation yeah. will... We, it, somehow, the mathematical realities that seem to exist here as ideas correspond to the world out there. And that was the thing it's that the Einstein... the other way around. That was the thing that Einstein was baffled by. He himself said the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that the universe is comprehensible. Yeah, How can the random event here describe the apparently irrational events out there. It models it. It models that. If, you, if you're looking at reality, your brain as it's functioning creates a temporary or hypothetical model that which you then test empirically. So, so we create our own brain, reality. We don't create our own reality. We create our own hypotheses. We create our own models and then we test to see whether they correspond with reality. If they don't, we reject them. We throw out the ether. We, we're out of time? Can yeah, I ask yeah, you one question? To, yeah, do, do you have a question you'd like to ask? I'll just ask you one. I had like four questions here, but let's move it on. Um, I just want you to define spirit or soul. Not in negatives, not what it isn't, but just define what a spirit is. What is it? And how does it differ from nothing at all? Well, what is energy? Measurable. There's no physicist who can, t you can describe how it moves. Your God concept is energy. Uh, there was some pre-existing, fluctuating sea of probably eternal energy of some sort. That's not a God. Uh, well, it's a divinity concept. It's, no, it that, it's that on which everything else depends. That's not a God. Well, by whose definition? You're asking me to define God, now you're defining God for me. A God is a personal being. A God... By definition, is a personal being who created and maintained. Not the according to the, to the Buddhists and the Hindus, God isn't a personal being. Well, then that's a deity. That's not a God. A God is a personal being with thoughts and intentions who created and maintains the universer. So not a bad, not a bad definition. We universe you answers my question. We, we atheists. God are, is a spirit, and he's okay. a person. Right. So, but if I ask you to give me a description of something uh, that uh, you say is the basis of everything, energy, you cannot give me. No physicist. And I've got physicists, friends at Oxford, who've talked to me about this. You, no physicist can say what energy actually is. We can describe some of its movements. Now, I can, the Bible, the, in terms of the Christian concept of God, the Bible gives us a revelation of a personal God. That's why he's called the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's known by his actions, his activity, and history. In the same way that you would want to say, well, energy is understood by the way it moves, by the way it acts, God, yes, he is for us in, in terms of our understanding of in Christian revelation. He is personal and he, because he interacts with persons. He's made a personal universe in which we can have interpersonal, intersubjective relationship, mutual understanding, mutual rational understanding, because there is a common creator for both the external world and our own minds. Why so, don't you answer Dan's question? I have. God is spirit. Joe. Dan answered it for me. Are you sorry? Are you, part of, are you in the cross-exam or are you going to wait for the Q&A? <laughs> But I want to know, Joe Boot has a spirit that's going to survive the death of the body. What is that? You say it's a thing. It's, a, it's an immaterial thing. What is that thing? What well, is it's, it? It, it would, it's the seat of personality, will, and intelligence. But what is it? Why can't, if you can describe those things in purely physical ways... Well, it's not material. Can't, I can't... Just, I can't uh, this is the whole, that is why this is a worldview-dependent question. A non-material what? A non-material what? What is it? Being. What does that mean? Well, what is being? You tell me. Right here, I have, I have atoms, I have material, I have, no. I have a head, I can touch you. There are multiple views of atoms and atomic theory. Ernst Mack did not, but he thought they were useful fictions. There was a whole school of scientists and philosophers so who followed So a spirit it. is a physical thing? No, a spirit is something that we cannot describe in terms of the physical property. You're, what you're doing is you're well, saying... how Joe, do you describe it? You're, 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 drawing the, you're drawing the court in which I have to serve the ball. You're saying... 
that the only things that are real are material. Therefore, if I can't give a material empirical description of spirit, it doesn't exist. Well, do you have any dis definition of spirit, what it is? You know what I mean? How does it differ from just an idea? It's nothing? not material. And not material what? It is, it's, it's the center and seat of will, personality, and intelligence, and it isn't material. Well, it cannot be, which simply means it cannot be reduced to the biochemical functions of the brain. A brain is the center and seat of a personality, right? So is the spirit a brain? No, the, the, the brain is the organic aspect of our being that interacts with our soul or spirit in a way that we can't fully describe. So a spirit has physical properties, if it interacts. But no, it doesn't, it doesn't need to have physical properties to interact with, in the same way that thought on your worldview, you've got to have thought interacting with physical properties. It's no, somehow an emergent... <laughs> thought has to be an emergent property of matter in your thinking. It's not a property, it's a function. A function, then. That's equivocation. A function of... You know, is thought the same thing as a, a rolling marble across the floor? No. Would you call digestion a property? It's a function Di of Yes, an digestion is a function of the tissue, of the, of, of the digestive system. But it doesn't exist. But how, can, how can you, how, how can you uh, uh, equate intelligence, thought, which you've already admitted cannot be reduced to, the semiotics cannot be reduced to the ink and chemistry of the paper. Information science has shown that information is carried on physical things, but the physical things are not the information. We have molecular messages born on the backs of molecules, but the molecules are not the message. I think we've reached the point of redundancy. Yeah. <laughs> so in other words, we don't have a definition of spirit. We'll, we'll conclude uh, the program with uh, a few questions from, from the audience. Let me begin with, I've got one written question here for uh, each of our speakers. So uh, beginning with uh, Reverend Boot. Uh, Reverend Boot, uh, is the afterlife existing only in what is referred to as heaven, or do you believe that the afterlife can be here on earth? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the Christian concept of the afterlife uh, is that um, it is not simply the nebulous idea of heaven. Christian doctrine is not that we are disembodied spirits with numbers floating around playing harps and sitting on clouds. The, uh, the Christian doctrine of the afterlife is that there is a new heavens and a new earth uh, which has a new moral quality. Jesus, uh, uh, we haven't had time to discuss or debate the issue of the resurrection of, of Christ. But Jesus' resurrection, physical resurrection, was actually very important in terms of the Christian worldview. That is, why, would, why wouldn't it not have been sufficient just for Christians to, stay, to say or for Christ to have been raised spiritually, to have had no corporeal, physical uh, resurrection? It was important because uh, human beings are a unity. It's, we, Christianity is not, doesn't have a radical dualism that says there's this like, uh, spirit here, material here, and they are divergent. No, that's why there is the resurrection of the body at the judgment. So there is an ongoing unity of body and soul uh, in the afterlife. That is the, the, that is the full Christian conception. And uh, the afterlife is actually a, a corporeal existence on a new earth, not, not simply an uh, ethereal existence in heaven. I'm just answering the question. I'm just uh, by answering doctrinally what the, as related to the question. Okay, and uh, next question for uh, for Dan. Uh, philosophical naturalism uh, is like a drunk who lost his car keys at night but insists on looking for them <coughs> under the street lights. How do you justify negating the afterlife by observation within <coughs> science? How do I? What? Say, read that last part. <laughs> I, th I think that the question is, if I can interpret it. Uh, I'll just say it again. I okay. Didn't... Well, the first, how do you justify negating the afterlife with a, a sci with scientific reasoning? If it, the, uh, the implication is that maybe it's outside of science. Well, if it's outside of science, Joe is right. We have no debate. You can just believe it. Um, if you're asking me to accept a claim that you're making, you're going to have to make you're going to have to make a case for it. Don't just say it's outside of science. Um, science is a light. You're right. We are looking in the street light, but that's all we've got right now. This, 
if there is a supernatural world, scientific principles are not going to know that. If there's something that's non-scientific, then science isn't going to address that. So uh, we, we do the best we can with the tools we have, with the models we make. That, and we make mistakes. Science has made a lot of mistakes, but the correction mechanism is within science. When science makes a mistake or has a question, we don't go outside. So uh, all of us have a naturalistic worldview. Joe is asserting there's something else above and beyond. So, and by the way, the Bible very clearly describes heaven as a city with streets of gold, a city. Thank you. Now, I'll uh, we'll take questions from, from the mic. Uh, uh, my question is directed at uh, Reverend Joe Boot. I'm going to explain a hypothetical situation, then I just want to ask my answer after that, question after that. Imagine we are in occupied France during World War II. There is a train uh, full of Jews inside, and there is a Nazi guard uh, with a machine gun. And allies are coming closer. And that guy kills everyone in that train. And five minutes before he's captured, he gets onto his knees and confesses to his sins and accepts Jesus as his personal savior. Those Jews are dead. They didn't believe Jesus was their Christ. In this situation, who's going to heaven and who's going to hell? That's uh, a good question, uh, and I appreciate where it's coming from. Um, the Christian uh, biblical doctrine of repentance doesn't really work like that. A lot of people think that uh, uh, they will have a willingness. They say to themselves, well, you know, there may be something in this God thing, but uh, I really want to enjoy my life. I want to, as though God is somehow a killjoy and will eliminate your enjoyment. Jesus says, I've come, you might have life and life in all its fullness. And so therefore I'll live it as I want and then maybe at the end, just in case I'll, you know, uh, in the same way as the allies are coming in, uh, maybe just in case I'll, I'll repent. Now, uh, the, first of all, no human being, uh, including myself, is in a position to judge uh, in that situation. God alone is the judge of all the earth, that's what the Bible says. God alone can judge the integrity, the thoughts of a, of a person's heart. Uh, but I don't believe that somebody who's just uh, splattered people all over a railway car uh, and then gets down on his knees to repent has any sincerity in his being. And so uh, I would find uh, the idea of such a repentance and turning to be uh, hollow. When uh, Jesus went to the house of Zacchaeus, who was a tax collector, uh, Zacchaeus' response, who, and who had actually over-collected, his response to, was to restore four times as much. The marks of repentance of a, a changed heart are uh, manifest in our actions. So, but God alone can judge the secrets of a person's heart, which is why the Bible says it's given for a person once to die, and after that, the judgment. God alone is able to judge the secrets of the heart. This question is for Dan Barker. Uh, Dostoevsky said that if there is no God, all things are permissible. Immanuel Kant said to this, uh, even if there was no God, we have to live like there is a God because without God, ethics are meaningless. Do you agree with this or what do you say in response to this? No. Um... If you think about that quote from Dostoevsky, if there is no God, all things are permissible. It's the other way around. If there is a God, all things are permissible because the seat of morality is divorced from reality and it becomes the whims of the mind of the deity. What be, what's right and wrong becomes a command from the deity. So you and I are unable to make moral decisions on our own. We must submit to whatever the commandments are. And look at what has happened when people do submit to the mind of this deity. It's not just the Lutherans and the Catholics exterminating Jews in Germany. It's the God of the Bible exterminating entire tribes of people because they had the wrong religious views. It's the um, devaluing of women in the Bible, the promotion of slavery. Jesus, for example, demonstrated how compassionate he was by saying, there are some slaves you should not beat as hard as others. Jesus said, think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. You cannot be my disciple unless you hate your family. Now, the, if you follow the teachings of this deity, if there were a God, this would be a really, if there were a God who commands morality, this would be a very dangerous world. 
Look at the holy wars. Look at all the atrocities committed in the name of this being. Look at things like 9-11. Those people believed in a God. Those Christians who prayed for God's protection, God bless America, their prayers failed. If there's a God who loves human beings, then it's manifestly not evident in the real world. And if you look at the headlines, an awful lot of the headlines have something to do with atrocities committed by or related to people who do believe in a God. Morality is not a question of a command. Morality is a question of trying to pick a path through life that results in the least amount of real harm. That's what morality is. And if you don't measure the relative merits of the consequences of your actions against real harm in the real world, you don't have the faintest clue about morality. Moral, religion compromises moral judgment. If you have religion instead of morality, then anything goes. If God does exist, then all things are permitted, and that is dangerous. Uh, okay, we'll take a couple more questions, then we'll, in view of the time, we'll have to uh, uh, draw it to the close. My question is for Joe Boot, uh, but it's contingent on a, a personal view of yours. Do you believe that humans were divinely created in their present form, or that they had evolved? Uh... I could uh, spend an hour answering that question. Um, the answer is, I believe that human beings, neither of those is right. Human beings were not created in exactly their present form because I believe in the Christian doctrine of the fall, which means that our being has been corrupted. Uh, I do not believe that there is uh, sufficient evidence to demonstrate that atoms became antelopes or that fish became philosophers. And uh, neither did Darwin, and uh, many of the modern uh, paleontologists uh, really are struggling to produce the evidence that there is the that, that we have tran that there has been transition from one basic type to another. We don't. I could we could digress here into a very long discussion about the merits of evolutionary theory. I don't think it's going to outlast the next 50 years in its current format. Maybe less. Uh, the uh, there's already signs uh, of the, uh, with the genetic revolution of the collapse of the, that paradigm. Nobody is a Darwinist today, they're neo-Darwinists. So uh, speaking of evidence, Dan has rattled on a great deal this evening about the truth of evolution, yet nobody was there 15 million, billion years ago, or however many million years ago, with respect to the uh, uh, origin of man, to appear empirically observe it. And uh, Darwin himself said, why am I not kicking around all these fossils in my back garden? of these transitional forms. They ought to be so numerous, there should be no problem. There should be demonstrable proof that these basic types have all come about by a gradual process, unless you're going to adopt Stephen Jay Gould's punctuated equilibrium. So, no, as a Christian, I actually believe that uh, man was created by an act of divine fiat, that he is qualitatively distinct from animals. This is to uh, Mr. Barker. Um, good evening. I just have a question. Uh, you said in your opening, opening statement, I just want to make sure I get this right. You said uh, thoughts are physical atoms of functioning. Therefore, when we die, it stops. So there's no con conception of life after death. Then you said in your rebuttal, um, when I think of a mouse, my brain doesn't get heavier because those thoughts are material. So I'm confused. Are our thoughts and conceptions of our mind material things? Therefore, your argument of saying therefore there's no life after death because we die, they're not. It's material things, so it's no more. Or are thoughts just a conception, non-material, so that your brain doesn't get heavier when you think of new things? So I'm just. I, I don't want. I'm not trying to be facetious. I just want to understand your argument. So I don't, yeah. yeah. No, I understand. Um, the um, the mistake that some theists make, and I think even some atheists make, is to reify a concept. Just because you have a concept or a label for something, I, I know that digestion is very simplistic, but let's say you have the word digestion, which is a label for the way an organ is functioning, right? Uh, doesn't mean that therefore, to reify means to turn that word into a thing as if it were a thing. So, if I have a Polaroid snapshot of a, a mouse, and next to it I have a Polaroid snapshot of a volcano. They both weigh the same, don't they? 
the volcano one's not going to weigh more, although it's representing something that's bigger. The same way, the brain makes models of things within this cranium, and it can make a model of something infinitely larger, tinier, whatever. It doesn't mean there's any reality within the brain of that image. It just means that our, our arrangement of the, the molecules and the neurons within our brain is making a different model, just like the <coughs> atoms on that Polaroid are making a different picture that we are modeling. So no one thinks that the Polaroid snapshot of a volcano is a volcano. It's just a piece of paper with atoms on it. The same thing with our brain. No one thinks, I mean, maybe some people do, but I don't think that the fact that our brain makes models of reality to the best of our abilities means that somehow those models are actual things. It's, a, it's the, the fallacy of reification to turn a word into a thing. And that's, I think that's what happens with the word God. We have the word God and people imagine that God is actually a thing when it's just a metaphor. Just like the Bible used metaphors, the parables were metaphors, Adam and Eve is a metaphor, and God is just one big, huge figure of speech. It doesn't mean he actually exists in reality. I'm a medical student, so when you say digestion, I just want to understand, so when something is digested, are you saying it doesn't exist, so when I have a patient who has no digestion, do I say it doesn't exist? Or do I, I just want to understand, like, what do you mean? Is it like a, like a thought? I don't have to say it's a physical thing, it's just a conception. The, just, stomach, the yeah. stomach exists. The chemicals in the stomach exist. Those things exist, but digestion is a label to describe a process, a functioning of those parts. The digestion is not a thing that actually exists. And when our brains are functioning, ideas, the word, the ideas, the concepts are labels for something that doesn't exist in reality. It's a description of how something is functioning. So you can't take that description and turn it into a thing. You can't reify something that's just a model for something else. Okay, this will be the last question. Thanks for the water, whoever brought it up. Um, my question is for Joe. Uh, my question is, why would a perfect God create an imperfect world? Meaning, I know you're going to say free, like God gave us free will, but why God would you give us free will if he knew that there was going to be suffering, if he knew that innocent kids are going to get raped? Why, why free will? Why not just choose to give us happiness, no pain? Oh, God, he now needs five hours to explain. <laughs> <laughs> In his world, nothing can be explained in five minutes or five words. Yeah, two, two minutes at the maximum. <laughs> uh, well, you ask a very uh, old uh, and important question that uh, uh, people have asked for a very long time. Um, I think one of the things that needs to be said, first of all, is uh, why do we think that those things are objectionable in the first place? If the world is, when we, when we analyze uh, our frustration, disappointment, hurt with the way that the present world is, why should we feel that way? I mean, if we are matter in motion, if we are just uh, flotsam that evolved rationality, slime from the goo through the zoo to you, and there is nothing more to reality than that, that it's nature red in tooth and claw, that it's just the survival of the fittest, why would we expect to find anything other than uh, suffering? This is why Dawkins has said, after his moral tirade against God, that the universe is just blind, pitiless indifference. The only people seeking to offer a response to the problem of evil are theists, because in the end, the atheist doesn't have any basis to ground the concept of evil. He just has... Uh, uh, ideas existing in his mind, he maybe has preferences that he, that he prefers one thing to another, but he doesn't believe in the reality of evil and the reality of good as objective conditions. Now, the Christian explanation is that God did not make the world in the context of uh, rebellion and sin and evil, but it was a good creation, and that but creation... Did God, but did God not know? God knows what's going to happen. God knew that there was going to be suffering. God knew that yes, there was... Yes, he did. So why, why did I, he choose to do that? He deemed, it, he deemed it... The only answer I can give you there is that he deemed it more important to create, that, that you're here, than not to create you. That your existence was more significant and important than your non-existence. That, uh, and that there are things that can be learned even in the process of suffering. My wife was diagnosed with cancer a year and a half ago. So as a Christian theist, what's my response to that? She was 39 years old. I've got three small children. 
Uh, does that mean now, well, I'm not going to believe in God anymore. He hasn't given me what I wanted, perfect health till I'm 80. Or is there something in the process of suffering in a fallen world that transforms who I am as a husband, as a father, does something in her life? Even to the point where pain does serve important functions in her life. You drop a piano on your foot, you want to lift it off pretty quick. It's painful. Right? It tells us you don't want to break your toe. Lift the piano off. Uh, emotional pain performs a function in our lives. So I can't, theodicies have been developed in response to the problem of evil. But uh, the, re the thing is, if you believe, if you're asserting that there is real evil in the world, you're already presupposing a theistic position on reality. If you're an atheist, you don't have real evil, and there can't really be an objection to suffering and evil in the world. That's just the way the world is. It's Maybe blind, God pitiless. Is evil. <laughs> well, uh, that's a standard. The, the, uh, you, can, you can certainly say that uh, on the basis of the, the way you're viewing the evidence, you can ask the question, is God evil? But if there's real evil, there has to be real good. And the Christian worldview, evil is only that you can, if you take an apple, a good apple, it has its, uh, a nice ripe apple, it has, it's an apple, it has its existence, its being, this is what Augustine said, because it's been created as an apple. Now when you leave that apple for say, four weeks out on the kitchen table, it steadily decays. Uh, it's still an apple, but it's not what it was fully intended to be. It's, 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 uh, it's still an apple by virtue of the fact that it's been created, but it's distorted, it's marred, it's gone rotten. And uh, the, the, the Christian worldview says that evil doesn't have existence in itself. It is always a parasite on good. It's a, it's a corruption of that which is good. When you analyze evil and men's moral choices, they're usually aiming at what they think is a good end, but they're doing so by wrong means. And that's why the Bible says that uh, sin is violation of the law of God. It's to break the law of God. It's to come short of something. It's the corruption of something. Well, I'd just like to thank uh, both our, our speakers, uh, Dan Barker and uh, Joe Boot, for a really very stimulating and wonderful debate tonight. So let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> and by way of Trying to sum things up, I'd just like to leave you with a couple of thoughts tonight. Uh, being moderator, I won't take one side or the other, but I think we can say one or two things with, with certainty. One is that uh, the only thing that makes us different, people different today from those who lived, say, 30,000 years ago, is culture. That, that, that we built one thing on, on top of another, things are passed on from generation to generation. You can call, you can label that religion or you can label it in other ways. <clears throat> but we have built successively these layers of uh, what it, which we now call civilization. And perhaps the, the one quote from the Bible that I think should be taken absolutely literally, although not in the way it was originally intended, is the uh, opening uh, uh, verses from the uh, uh, book of, of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the word was God. Now the interesting thing is that the, in the original Greek version, the, it's been translated, the original Greek was logos, meaning logic. So perhaps God exists within the debate. Perhaps God is the, the debate that's going on tonight, the intellectual activity uh, that is based on this rich heritage that we've all uh, inherited. So thank you very much for your participation. Thanks to the audience for your audience. Oh, did you want to do it?